that. Very small foot, whoever it might be. Uh, Ray, I don't think it's going to fit you. Uh, just going to be honest. Just, just going to be honest there. Thank you for coming out in the inclement weather, being a part of this service tonight. We are glad that you are here. It is a pleasure and a thrill to see you as we begin to get towards the end of our story. As we've been talking for the last several weeks about the story of Jesus, starting in the book of Genesis and working our way all the way through to the book of Acts today. And I don't know if you're like me, but most guys, like I do, love action movies. I just do. I love it. Especially when the heroes kind of, you know, have to go through that transformational moment when they, when they discover who they are and when they, when they realize how much power that they actually have. I, I love it. I also love horror movies, but you didn't need to know that. That's another lesson for another time. Now, I love it, though, when, when Superman comes to the realization that he is stronger than the other guys, or Spider-Man accepts the great responsibility that comes with his powers, or, or maybe it's Jason Bourne discovering who he used to be before the government messed him all up, and all of them have to embrace who they are, and they have to embrace who they were really meant to be. You know what else I love? I love a great conversion story. I was in the, in the, in the foyer this, uh, this evening and talking to uh, uh, someone who just had been converted, just came to know the Lord, and to hear her story was so cool, and it was so great uh, to listen to that. And I love conversion stories probably because I think they're kind of equivalent to the stories of superheroes kind of discovering who they are, discovering their powers. And stories of how people have gone from not knowing Jesus to inviting him into their lives. And, and one of the questions that I like to ask people on a regular basis is simply, tell me your story. Uh, how, how did you get where you are? Tell me your story. Those are the best. They are real and they are true and they're better than any comic book or any movie or any hero's adventure or any covert agent's secret mission. You know, as I think about it, a lot of people think that people in my line of work uh, have believed in Jesus from the minute they were born. Uh, that there probably is a little stereotype that goes on about preachers out there. And while it is true that a lot of ministers, including myself, were blessed with faithful parents who took us to church every single Sunday and taught us how to love Jesus, I know that's not everyone's story. Not just every minister, but every person. That's, that's not everyone's story. And the neat, neat thing about conversion stories is that they can be as unique as fingerprints. Everyone might have some similarities, but they're all a little bit different too. And some people have a difficult time identifying the specific time when they first believed because they just grew up believing. They, they grew up in church. Other members can remember the exact moment when they gave their life to Jesus and were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Still others can point to a dramatic event in their life that woke them up to their deep need for God. And what all these stories have in common is how trusting in Jesus Christ absolutely changed their lives. Because here's the truth I need you to get today. When you decide to follow Jesus, you are also accepting his mission. When you make the decision to follow Jesus, I need you to know you must accept his mission as well. And if you won't accept the mission of God, then you probably really haven't decided to follow Jesus the way that you're supposed to. You accept his mission when you come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. You are just so grateful to experience God's love that you should want to share that with other, others, everyone around you, anyone you can get your hands on. And there are very few people in history who have had a dramatic conversion experience as powerful and impactful on the Christian faith as a young Jewish man who experienced a radical 180 degree turn in his life. Saul, who was a zealous Jew, who took it upon himself to try to stop the spread of this new movement that had begun by Jesus. When one of Jesus' followers, Stephen, was being stoned to death for teaching about Jesus, it was, it was Saul who gave the crowd the approval to kill him. And from that point on, Scripture tells us that Saul began everything that he could and sought out to destroy the church. Like a bounty hunter, he roamed the land, breathing out threats against the Lord's disciples. You can kind of see that, that, that hatred and that venom that he had in his heart and the things that he did before he had this road experience. 
on one of his missions to track down the followers of Jesus, he experienced that roadblock, if you will. Literally, in the form of a godly smackdown, he gets knocked to the ground, and a voice calls out from heaven, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it was Jesus who changed his name and changed his mission from Saul to Paul. And that new mission was to carry out with the same zeal that he had a a brand new desire to teach everyone about Jesus Christ. Talk about discovering your secret identity. Paul definitely did that after a visit from Jesus. In fact, he was so effective in teaching about Jesus Christ that he actually became the target of those unbelievers who at one time were his followers. I mean, talk about irony, right? This is the very definition of it. And over the course of the mission, Paul would end up being beaten many times for his faith, thrown into prison, and eventually killed for his extreme commitment to spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. What did Paul do? He submitted to Christ. And that's the lesson that I want to share with you tonight as we get started. Lesson number one is simply this. The word submit is not a four-letter word. It's not a curse word. It's not something we need to be afraid of. Instead, it is something we need to embrace. And I need you to understand tonight that that word submit is absolutely a loaded word. It is serious and it is somewhat difficult. And so if you'll allow me, I'd like to chase a rabbit here for just a second. And if you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Ephesians and notice with me chapter 5 and verse 21. Ephesians 5, 21. My guess is you know this verse, but I want to share it with you again tonight. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, says this. And remember, Paul is writing to a church. We're going to talk about that in just a second. He says, uh, go back to verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. We are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that word submit is actually two words stuck together. And the basic meaning that we get with those two words stuck together is, I am going to place myself under, I'm going to give allegiance to, I'm going to tend to the needs of, and I'm going to be responsive to one another. That's what he's saying. Be responsive to each other. Put yourself under one another. Some scholars believe that this originated as a military term in the sense of a soldier placing himself under their commanding officer. And this passage says that we are to place ourselves under for one very specific reason. We're to do that out of reverence for Jesus Christ. And so this reference to Jesus is calling you and it's calling me to follow his example, his sacrifice, his giving of his life for ours. He says, I want you to follow in my steps. As I did that for you, I want you to be willing to do that for others. Now, why would we do that? Very simply, we do that because people are worth dying for. Did you hear me? People are worth dying for. And so the the teaching of this passage in Ephesus to love and serve the people around you, placing their needs ahead of your own out of respect and reverence for Jesus who gave his life for us, this is what Paul is trying to teach us. But there's more. We've got to die to ourselves so that other people can live just like Jesus did. Paul, who understands this concept fully because he was a living example of it, wrote this to a church just like us. He wrote this to a church, to a group of people. And the church at Ephesus is being taught how to live together in such a way that when people observe their lives together, they will see what Jesus is like. And so the question is, when people look at us, do they see Jesus? Do they see what Jesus is like by the way we interact with each other, by the way we speak to one another and honor each other and place ourselves under each other? And in verse 22, Paul will go on to specifically charge wives to submit to their husbands. And I need you to know that the wife is not commanded here to do anything different from what everybody else was commanded to do in the previous verse, namely, submitting. 
And if you look to verse 23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives who submit in everything to their husbands. And that word head, not only is the word submit loaded, but that word head is as well. The larger point that Paul is trying to make is that the husbands are supposed to be like Christ. And what does that look like? Well, verse 24 tells us, Christ's headship comes from him giving himself up for the church. His sacrifice, his surrender, his willingness to give himself away, right? That's what, what, what Christ did for his church and that's what we guys are supposed to do for our brides. Whatever authority the word head carries, it is rooted in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so here's the point. Here's what we often miss. We often want others to submit to us. We often want other people to put themselves under us, right? We, we want that without us having to die, right? I just want you to do it because you should, not because I've actually done the stuff necessary for you to be willing to do that. It's crazy. We want others to submit to us without having to die. And I've seen this a hundred times in marriages and in leadership in general. The husband is waiting for the wife to submit. And as long as he keeps there waiting and not doing anything, he's actually failing to lead. He thinks he's the strong leader, but he's actually weak and misguided. And if he really wants to lead, then he would surrender his desires to hers. He would surrender his wants and his plans to hers. He would submit, just like Jesus did to the church. He would die to his need to be in control and to do whatever it takes to serve and to make sure that that other person has what they need because that's what Jesus did. The real leader dies to himself so that others can live. That's what Paul did. That's what Jesus did. And that's what he wants us to do as well. To support himself in this new mission that Paul has, he made tents, a tent maker. And today, as we look around this church and this world, we have hundreds of people who volunteer to go to other countries to spread the good news about Jesus. They support themselves with other occupations like carpenters and teachers and nurses and all kinds of stuff like that. And I love that. I think it's amazing. I think we need to continue to be about that here. And Paul responds to God's call to continue the job by taking the message of salvation to the ends of the earth. And who were the people at the ends of the earth? Well, it was the Gentiles. That's where they lived. Gentiles like Probably every one of us who's sitting in here tonight. And not only is this the commission that Jesus gave the church, but it is included in the promise that God made to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 15 at the beginning of the story of Jesus. If you remember back, Jesus, or he tells, God tells Abraham that it will be through his offspring that all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Not just the Jews, no, all nations. And Jesus is this offspring and Paul is the deliverer of the promise to the nations beyond Israel. And that is why Paul is so often referred to in the scripture as the apostle to the Gentiles. Now we know that Paul lived in a place called Antioch. And from there, he takes three long journeys over the course of about 10 years. We call them his three missionary journeys. And now you need to understand that travel in those days wasn't quite the same as it is in ours. Paul just couldn't click Travelocity and catch a sweet deal on an upcoming flight. That's not how it worked. It's not what he could do. Even short journeys posed a significant physical challenge. You either walked or you rode a camel or a donkey or you sailed the treacherous waters of the Mediterranean seas, not in boats like we have today, but instead in primitive sailing vessels. And Paul did all of that and then some. On his very first trip, he established a pattern of going to the Jewish synagogues first. In each town he visited, and he would preach to them about Jesus. When he was in Antioch Pisidian, for example, he was given the opportunity to speak, and they didn't even have an appointment. He, he just simply got up, explained the good news simply in a way his hearers would understand. Take a look with me, Acts chapter 13. <clears throat> Acts chapter 13, verse 27. Verse 27. 
Paul speaking and he says this, Acts 13, 27, for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, talking about Jesus, nor understanding the utterances of the prophets, which they read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, just as it is written in the second psalm. Today you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Jump to verse 38. So Paul finishes his sermon by saying this, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Oh, if we had time, I would love to dissect this sermon that that Paul preaches here. But here's the the thousand-foot view. Essentially, Paul is connecting the dots for these Jewish people so that they could see that even their own scriptures, what we know as the Old Testament, pointed to Jesus Christ. Everything that happened to Jesus was foretold in those ancient texts, including everything that was done to him on the cross. And then Paul, I love this, Paul simply invites his hearers to believe their own prophecies and accept the gift of salvation that Jesus offered. I love it. And the people of Antioch and Pisidian invited Paul to come back on the next Sabbath week, uh, uh, next week to speak again. And word got out, and on that day, man, nearly the entire population of the city gathered together to hear the message of Jesus. But the local religious leaders got a little jealous, and they started making trouble for Paul and his traveling companions. And that's when Paul decided to take his message on the road. Listen to verse 36, 46. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourself unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Paul is quoting from Isaiah 49, right? More than 700 years earlier, the prophet Isaiah knew the plan and how it would reach way beyond Israel. And that quote from verse 9, I will make you a light from the Gentiles. Isaiah 49, 6, I will make you a light to the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. And that's what Paul did. Fulfilling prophecy. He takes the good news to his Jewish countrymen. That's one thing. But when they rejected the message, he does something even more difficult. He takes this message to the Gentiles. The Gentiles don't have the same religious background. They don't know the ancient stories from the Old Testament. They don't know about Abraham and Moses. They don't worship Yahweh. They're not even looking for a Messiah. So what a challenge Paul has in front of him to move from his own countrymen to this new group of people that know nothing about nothing. Right? And in some ways, we face the same challenge whether we realize it or not. Here's something I've noticed over the years. Stop me if I'm wrong. But have you ever noticed how Christians just assume that everyone knows about what we know? You ever notice that? You ever notice that we we just tend to believe that everybody knows about our religious traditions and everything that comes with that? And so we try to share the good news by using language that no one really understands but us. (laughs) Have you, have you heard that happen? We talk about unfamiliar concepts that must look like, man, like we just arrived from another planet. We are a restoration church that believes in full sanctification by the atonement offered by Jesus. That's what we believe. And, and people that don't have any clue what we're talking about look at us like, huh? <laughs> what in the world does that mean? And that leads me to the second point that I want to give you tonight. It's simply this. We've got to meet people where they are. You know that's what the Apostle Paul does, right? He meets people where they are. And I think this is where Paul can teach us a few good things about communication. In chapter 17 of the book of Acts, Paul arrives in the city of Athens, and he might as well have been Superman arriving on earth from his native planet Krypton, because the citizens of this great city know nothing of the law, 
They know nothing of the prophets. They know nothing of the Psalms. They are known for their great intellect and their ability to reason, but they are not particularly religious. They at least tried to hedge their bets by setting up a a, a statue with the inscription to an unknown God. And we read about this in Acts chapter 17 and verse 23. But what I love about Paul is that he doesn't scold them. He doesn't jump on their cases because they're so off. No, he begins where they are. You ever wonder why I'm going to preach a Christmas lesson at Christmas and an Easter lesson at Easter? Because I want to meet people where they are. We're going to have people coming into this room and and they're going to be here and they're not going to understand the lingo that we have and they're not going to get it. And so I want to give them the basics on a day like that. When folks are here, it makes sense. I'm just following Paul's example. We meet them where they are. And so from this beginning of an unknown God, he preaches them about a God they don't really know. A God who's created the world and everything in it. And he doesn't need anything as far as need is concerned. But he wants us to search for him. And he wants us to find him. And what we see in Acts 17 is that some people reject his message. But many others are intrigued and they want to learn more. And so because Paul adjusted his message to meet the needs and interests of his audience. Paul is at least given a fair hearing. And he even convinces some to believe in his message During Paul's travels, the church grew rapidly. As many Jews and many more Gentiles came to faith in Jesus Christ, it was literally changing the spiritual climate of that entire region. In fact, if you go back to the city of Ephesus, for example, there was a whole bunch of people who came to faith in Jesus. People who had previously practiced sorcery, and they gathered together, according to Acts 19 and verse 19, they gather their pagan scrolls and they have a bonfire. They burn all of that nonsense publicly. The calculated value of 50,000 drachmas, which is what the amount is said in in Acts 19.19, is translated to about $4 million today. They burned $4 million worth of nonsense because they learned about Jesus and wanted to follow him fully and completely. You want to talk about repentance, there it is. And that's lesson number three. Repentance is still needed today. It is. I I think sometimes in our rush to get people into the waters of baptism that we forget to stress the importance of baptism and what it is and what it's all about and why people need to change and why people need to turn from their sin. Man, it's so important. I've said a thousand times, repentance is a change of heart that results in a change of action, right? And that's still needed for us to be right with God. A change of heart that results in a change of action. In the lower story, Paul was a devout Jew who thought he was justified in trying to stop the spread of this nonsense about Jesus. But in God's story, man, there's a completely different plan at play. And it was the same plan he had been working on from the first days in the garden. His plan was to bring his people back to him. And he knew that Paul would play an important role in that plan. And so by God's grace and the strength of the Holy Spirit, Paul did just that. He plants numerous churches in highly Gentile populated cities. He writes all kinds of letters, 13 of which we have contained for us here in the New Testament. And he writes these letters to help strengthen the churches throughout the entire world. And he provides us with an example of how to share the good news with people who may not be immediately inclined to accept it. You meet them where they are. I guess that's why I like superhero movies. I guess that's why I like conversion stories. Because conversion, after all, is change. It's a change. And it's in the change in a person's life, that's what I find so exciting. To watch someone completely transform their lives because of an understanding of who Jesus is, there's nothing like it in the whole world. There's nothing like it. Paul underwent an amazing change, and as a result, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of other lives were changed too. And so I want to close with this question today. I want you to feast on this this week. 
I know the Apostle Paul finally had his true identity revealed and then he began to live into that identity and follow Jesus with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. So here is my question. Have you allowed God to reveal who you really are? Have you allowed God to reveal who you really are? Feast on that this week. Ask yourself, Am I really living out the calling that God has on my life? Am I really who God would have me be? Have you allowed God to reveal who you really are? And if the answer is no, I hope that you'll listen. As you pray, as you commune, as you walk with the Lord, I hope that you'll listen. And I pray that you'll have the courage to take whatever steps that he calls you to take. If you're here tonight and not a Christian, man, maybe the identity that he's calling you to is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And if we can help you with that today by uh, sharing the good news of the gospel with you, or if you already know what that message is and you have decided today you want to repent like we talked about and, and confess Jesus as Lord and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and let's do that right now. If there's just something on your heart, if you just need the prayers of this church, we stand ready to help you any way we can while together we stand and sing this song your encouragement. All to Jesus I surrender.